Dzień dobry Państwu. Bardzo zapraszam do naszego drugiego panelu. This is going to be the second panel of this conference. The consequences of the war. What Europe will be like, what Poland will be like. That's the title of this panel. Now, this is the conference on the role of Christians in European integration. So, we will consider the following. What has been the role of the Church and what is the impact of the war for the Church and religious communities too? We have with us a representative of the Crimean Tatars, Mr. Nedin Usainov, who is with us. In this discussion, he is going to include how the Crimean Tatars are impacted by the war and how it impacts Europe. Let me begin in the following way. I'll ask an introductory question. I will ask about the institutional church's response to this challenge that this war is, this challenge that materialized last year. Let's talk about why this response was different from the appeals that we could hear during the civil war in Syria and other conflicts. Back then, the church leaders, leaders of various churches, immediately appealed to stop the military actions and spoke for peace. So was the same message actually spelled out this time, and if it was not, why so? Father Manuel Barrioso Prieto, the Secretary General at the Comercia, Comerci, would you please be so kind to respond first? Then I'll ask Massimiliano Sinifredi to speak next. Uh, he's a historian and an more important person at the community of San Egidio. This community organizes meetings for peace, and it continues the work that was started in 1986 in Assisi by John Paul II. So, um, first of all, um, I'm repeating a bit what I said this morning, I'll speak in English, um, is giving again thanks for being here uh, in this conference. And as I said, uh, the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences supports in a very strong way this conference, and it's, I think, the fourth year. We coincided also in other panels with other of the speakers here, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm, as I said this morning, the Secretary General of uh, the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union. And this, just to explain it a bit, so I enter, I can answer then the question. Um, this is an official body of the Catholic Church that has its headquarters in Brussels and represents the Catholic Church in the European Union before the European institutions. So that's um, our work as Comesia, as the Commission of the Bishops' Conference of the European Union, to maintain a dialogue with the European institutions, with the Parliament, with the Commission, with the Council, as far as possible. Huh? So we react as uh, Comesia to the events. Uh, our way of reacting is to try to have this dialogue with the European institutions when we see something happening, to make them aware, to advocate for what we think is important. So answering the question of the ambassador, um, I think um, it's important when this war is started, the annexation of Crimea first, then the invasion in February 2022 of Ukraine, I think the Church has been vocal. Uh, the context of Syria is different, but the Church has been vocal, has done what it has to do. It's called for prayer, and it's prayed, and I think this, we never, never have to forget that this is really an important part of the mission of the Church, uh, 
to pray, and the church has called for prayers and has prayed for peace. The church and the Pope has expressed many ways uh, his desire, his appeal for peace. I have here all, all a list of his interventions in the Angelus and so on, in which he has called for peace. And then I think uh, the diplomatic service of the Holy See has done, has tried to do its job. And we as Commissary also have organized meetings with the uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine. We have been uh, acting with the European institutions. So I think there has been a reaction. Huh? There has been a reaction. If this reaction, some might have liked it to be a bit more stronger, maybe. Huh? I know sometimes also the Pope might have not expressed himself well in some situations. Huh? But I think the Church has done what it has to do in such, a, in such a conflict, which is very sad because it's a conflict between Christians, and this is something that we have to keep in mind. Huh? And a conflict which has in its background an ecumenical context that is complicated. Huh? And this I think we will speak about it as well. So, um, answering your, th your question, I think the church has done what it has had to do, uh, what it had to do. Thank you. Dziękuję. Massimiliano, czy ty mógłbyś... Massimiliano, over to you. Could you tell us a bit more about the attempts that have been taken to act jointly? I mean, various attempts to act jointly by Christian churches to respond to this war. I'll give you an example. Has there been an attempt to organize a meeting that would be similar to the one in Assisi in response to this particular war? Because I know that there have been such initiatives to meet a number of uh, various church representatives in Kiev last year. Thank you. First, thank you to the Tadeusz Pieronek Foundation. This foundation has been forming this atmosphere that is good for cooperation and dialogue, which is so very important in the current age. So this meeting of religions for peace in Kyiv, it is a, dra a great dream. Yet, dreams need to be confronted with reality. If you do not confront them with reality, they will turn into naive utopias. So let's look at the current reality as it is. The current reality in Ukraine. There you can see a major clash of churches. Saint Egidio cannot organize a meeting in Kyiv when it's invited by one side only, as such an action would exclude others. This year we organized a meeting in Berlin. It was two weeks ago. It was a meeting in the spirit of Assisi and it was possible thanks to the invitation of the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. Unfortunately, the situation in Ukraine is as it is and there is division there. We need to talk about how this division impacts the war. I'm sorry, I had to prepare my speech. I'm lost in my notes at this point. All these sheets, after all. The president, the chair, rather, of the session likes surprises. And I'm happy to hear that. Let's look at the facts. In Ukraine, you see the burden of history. You see this burden of great history and how this burden impacts people's everyday lives. So ecumenism there often was um, treated as a hobby of good people who are in dialogue. Ecumenism is something that is needed like we need the air. 
because it allows you to live together. This ecumenical dialogue had been closed in university halls. Yes, theologians were in dialogue, they remained in dialogue, that's true. The thing is, we need ecumenism that would permeate the lives of people. They need it in their lives. Let me give you a quote here. Athenagoras, a great pat patriarch. He was a hero of this meeting that took place in Jerusalem. Paul VI was there. It was 1964. Athenagoras, the patriarch, said, theologians have their words that they want to say, but people have their own opinion too. And there is something very right about what they think, the, the people of God. So John Paul II made this unforgettable journey to Romania, the first pope trip made by Rome to, to this type of a country. Unitate, unitate, they were shouting, um, unity, unity. And it was uh, the first trip to an orthodox country, is it not? So, we are talking about dialogue and ecumenism. It is mostly, actually, the problem of the internal dialogue in the Orthodox Church, because we are looking at this internal problem. The question is, how can you have this dialogue among Christians? How can you do that when Orthodox Christians hate each other? Well, our Congress has this calling. We, Santa Gigi, we are supposed to create conditions of mutual respect and joint action. Thank you very much. You have introduced a number of very interesting themes here. You've also followed up on the issue of cooperation and joint living outside of institutional churches. And now, Nedim Olsainov, sir, I will ask you to say a few words. Please tell us about Crimean Tatars. Crimean Tatars were the first victim of the Russian aggression in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. The Russian sources over 200,000, including many Crimean Tatars, fled from the Crimea in the year 2014. They were replaced by 400,000 Russians from various parts of Russia, and that changes the ethnic makeup of the Crimean Peninsula. Then I'll ask Professor Azhakovsky, who is an expert in Orthodox, actually. He has been working of ecumenism and Orthodox Church for years now. I'll ask you, Professor, to say a few words about this relationship within the Orthodox Churches. Tell us about this dialogue, what it looks like, what it could look like, the dialogue above certain divisions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hussainov. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank the organizers for their invitation. Thank you, thank you for making it possible for me to take part in this discussion to represent Crimean Tatars. I represent the World Congress of Crimean Tatars in Poland. Let me also try to explain after 2020 when the term of office of the current Coordination Council ended, uh, the war actually made it impossible to have new elections and the Congress as a democratic assembly where delegates from the whole world uh, arrived. There are four to five million Tata from Crimea around the world. Those, those living in Crimea only are a small fraction of this community. So I do hope that next year or maybe even sooner we will be able to organize uh, the next uh, assembly and I will uh, hopefully vote for uh, my colleague, uh, a lady actually, who will replace me. Uh, and next time perhaps 
at this conference. She will actually be present here to speak on behalf of the Crimean Tatars. Yes, we don't have enough uh, women here, unfortunately, especially in our panels. Um, it would be excellent, yes, to have a lady with us representing Crimean Tatars present. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've noticed my delicate allusion to the representation of men and women here. Now going to the very subject matter of our discussion. In order to be able to speak about Crimean Tatars, of course, you need to take into account also the political uh, context. Uh, it's a Muslim community that is in a very difficult situation at the moment. We speak about religion, so I have to mention that. And yes, as you said, this was we were the first victim. 2014, annexation of Crimea by Russia. And the situation was such that, well, today we can we can say we've got the results of some research, also my personal research. Uh, the annexation process uh, had been planned, and actually the preparation was started, in my view, already between 2008 and 2010. Putin had plenty of time to prepare for the annexation. For this reason. The annexation was so fast, and actually the greatest obstacle for the new Russian order in Crimea after annexation were Tatars living there. They are still loyal to Ukraine, and they were the most uh, vocal group that was speaking out against Russian annexation. So actually what Putin did, first of all, he tried to subjugate to Russia the uh, local government of Tatars and local institutions, and then to take control of religious organizations. The institution of the Mufti, as you know, it has been and still is the, the most important organization, religious organization of Crimean Tatars, representing the Muslim community in the Crimea. And the Russians, when they uh, uh, annexed uh, uh, Crimea, they gave a difficult choice to this organization. Either you cooperate with us and you accept uh, that we are the masters, or we will be creating new obstacles for you, among others, creating new alternative religious organizations. They were created, actually. And uh, there was an attempt to take control of uh, mosques, uh, buildings, uh, by those new Russian organizations. And some of the buildings were managed by the local uh, church. They were independent, and many of them were taken over. Control was taken over by the new organization. The next stage, actually, after completing the first one, was that those communities, religious communities, that did not want to accept the control of uh, Russia, they were more and more there are more and more pressures and then examples of um, persecution. There are more than a hundred political prisoners in Crimea. A number of them actually attended mosques that uh, did not want to accept uh, Russian rule. So in this way they managed to clear ground for uh, further action, actually, uh, the voice of the local Tatars uh, is not so clearly heard now, especially outside the Crimea. Crimea uh, Peninsula is almost an island today, as you know, because uh, once uh, political institutions such as Medjis and Skurut were liquidated, they subjugated other institutions and, of course, they subjugated independent media. The Muslim community has no voice actually at the moment. We don't know exactly what is happening there. Or in other words, people in the Western world know very little or know nothing about what actually happens uh, to the Muslim community in the Crimea today. Well, this unfortunately also has an impact on our assessment and understanding of the situation there, who the Tatars are, and whether at all they want to uh, and the Crimea to be uh, won back by Ukraine. Dziękuję za te za to naświetlenie kwestii. Thank you very much 
for showing us uh, this uh, situation of the Crimean Tatars. Yes, I can agree. We do not have much information uh, about the situation there. Some of the information is passed on via Turkey, perhaps, because there are some communities of Tatars from the Crimea in Turkey, and Turkey sometimes speaks out on behalf and sometimes protests also on behalf of those Tatars from the uh, peninsula. Can we move on now in more detail to those uh, Eastern Orthodox churches? As uh, Massimo Sinifredi said, sometimes it's difficult to speak to the Orthodox uh, world because it's divided. There are internal divisions, many divisions and conflicts within the Orthodox world. It would be difficult to find a better specialist than Professor Antoine Ajakovsky from Paris, who for decades has been dealing with this uh, subject. Uh, the Orthodox Church is ecumenism and has excellent knowledge on this Thank subject. You. Professor on the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you uh, for your invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be among you. Thank you for the Tadeusz Pironek and for, from the EPP group also. Um, and Krakow is a beautiful city, so I'm very glad to be here. I'm, I can speak very long about the divisions of the Orthodox Church. Uh, the, f the most important thing for me to say is that we need to admit that there is a, a, a very deep crisis. These churches failed to promote peace, to sustain peace, to build peace. It's a collective responsibility. Myself, I am a Christian Orthodox. I was born in a Christian Orthodox family. But I saw already from a long time that there is a big problem, a very long, which has long, deep roots. And this is why I created, a, I founded a, an Institute of Ecumenical Studies at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv more than 50 years ago. And next week there will be a, a conference, a social week, ecumenical social week on churches during the war in Ukraine. And our main analysis is to say that these last years, uh, these churches, they wanted to define themselves as institutions and not as churches. Institutions are the structures that need to, to see in order to believe. Whereas the churches believe in order to see. And this is what started at the Pan-Orthodox Council in 2016 in Crete. I had the privilege to be there and to see that this Pan-Orthodox Council that was supposed to, to solve the problem of autocephaly, of unity among churches, that was prepared during more than a century, especially from the 60s when there was the uh, Vatican Council, the Patriarchate in Agoras wanted to to do also a pan-Orthodox council and go to unity. And we failed, there was always this um, challenge between the ecumenical patriarchate on one side who has the legitimacy of the oldest church and the first place in the diptychs of the 15 autocephalist churches in the world. And on the other side, the Moscow patriarchate who considers that today it is the biggest and the richest church Orthodox in the world more than a hundred millions of believers, and of course a very rich uh, church that is financed by the states. So from the 70s, they, they had several schisms that, that were overcome. But in 2016, the idea was to definitely overcome the, this um, uh, battle uh, around the idea of who is the first, who is who has the primacy, and to solve the question of the autocephaly was to solve the question of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Uh, what is the main criteria? Is it a, a criteria of canonicity, uh, territorial canonicity? Is it an historical uh, criteria, which means that it should be in that case from the Ecumenical Patriarchate, because it was the Ecumenical Patriarchate who founded this church at the 10th century. And at the last minute, when everybody was, did, did finally find an agreement, 
the Moscow Patriarchate didn't come, 15 days before the Council, whereas it was prepared during 50 years. Because the Patriarch Kirill uh, was frightened that if he comes and uh, uh, recognizes Bartholomé as the first among the equals, then the next decision of Bartholomé to recognize the autocephaly of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, would not be acceptable for him, but it would be too late. So he didn't come. And that was the start of a whole process, which is part of the war today between Russia and Ukraine, which are the two most important churches in the world, 100 million on one side, 25 million Orthodox churches, uh, 25 million people in the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and the recognition of autocephaly for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine by um, the Ecumenical Patriarchate in 2019, and the decision from the Moscow Patriarchate in this case to stop any connect, contact with Ecumenical Patriarchate. And now there is a schism between these churches. And the, the other problem is that the other Orthodox churches, the 13 other Orthodox churches, including the Orthodox Church of Poland, didn't decide to condemn one or the other. They decided to be neutral. And the result of this situation is that before the um, Ecumenical Assembly last year in Germany, in Karlsruhe, no Orthodox Church condemned the Moscow Patriarchate. And so the Moscow Patri all these churches went, came, they were not suspended from the Assembly of the World Council of Churches, which means that there is no, today, a possibility to judge and to say, of course, the Patriarch Bartholomew said the, the war is very bad. And the, uh, the World Council of Churches has said the war is very bad. But the result is that nothing has changed. Institutions stayed institutions. But for me, church is deeper than institution, and this is why we need that kind of debate. Thank you very much. Last year, we hosted the head of the Otto Kefalus Church of Ukrainian Church, Apiphonius, the metropolitan of the church. We spoke also on this uh, last year. Thank you, Professor. Professor Arzhakovsky also, his uh, intervention leads to the next question I wanted to pose. On the one hand, we've got the answers of the institutional churches or the lack of a response of institutional churches to the challenge of the war. And on the other hand, we've got the faithful, the national church that uh, have taken action in the context of, of the war also, uh, feeling pressure of, of the faithful. I've got the following question now to you, gentlemen. How do the national churches evolve? How do they change uh, with the Ukrainian refugees arriving in uh, different locations? And how do they change also with this uh, deeply felt need to respond to the, the war that is such a tragedy for many of the faithful. Is there any change? Is there any impact of the war? What is the impact of the war, not only on Orthodox churches, but also other Catholic churches? Manuel, please. Well, um, I would say, obviously, we have the issue of refugees. Um, we have an important presence of Ukrainian uh, uh, persons in European countries. I don't know, I think the Catholic Church here is trying to do what it can. It's receiving these persons, it's trying to, to, the Pope says, receive them, defend them, accompany them, and that's, I think, what we're doing. Huh? Is there a change in our countries due to this or in our churches? Uh, Catholic Church, I would say no, I would say no. But I think really the change where the, uh, that could be or is present in some way, or is the, the inside the Orthodox world. This is really where, where I think 
uh, this issue is very important because we, I was, when, um, when I was thinking about uh, this uh, meeting this afternoon, I said, well, is this division in the Orthodox Church of the two patriarchates, the patriarchate of Constantinople and the patriarchate of Moscow, is, was before the war. Uh, so it's, uh, has it in some way fueled or caused the war? Uh, has the war changed this in some way or affected this? So I'm, I'm going to do a question to him because uh, I think what he, what he said before, it's, it's very important because the issue of the divisions inside the Orthodox Church and the war is really something very, very interesting. So I don't know. I would just ask, because I think this is really important, what he said before on, the, on these divisions inside the Orthodox Church. Professor Rzakowski, a question to you. This is the question that is important to all of us, I believe. There was this influx into Europe, a few million Orthodox people from Ukraine that belong to different churches. It forces societies and various churches to set up something to form some kind of a religious service on the one hand, but also we are forced to ask a question, what is the role of the Orthodox Church here in Europe? The war, after all, churches the relationships within Europe. And in the previous panel, we talked about Moldova and Ukraine could be, in a few years' time, except into the EU. If so happens, there will be a very strong Orthodox Church here in Europe. And the question is, to what extent this Orthodox Church in Europe will be included, or rather be part of this reflection on treaties and on the EU and its shape? Professor, could you please answer this question? Maybe you may. I know that I'm going outside of the script that I've sent you before. Um, well, again, we need really to understand that uh, the Orthodox Church is uh, in a bad shape. When you suffered during centuries uh, from a, a bad political theology, which is not able to divide political power from religious power, then the reaction when you are in, a, in an empire is to try to, to um, disconnect with the church if you disagree with the with, uh, with the position of the church um, or if you don't have any education then you become yourself a nationalist imperialist and what we see what we see is that uh, the people who are leaving Russia for instance because they don't want to to fight in Ukraine it's more than one million Russians that left uh, Russia uh, from last year. They, they, they go to Armenia, they go to Georgia, and then they go to Western Europe, and they do not try to, to connect with the, with the churches in general, because for them, the churches are instruments of power. So that's the, the first of... Uh, the churches are the sources of their problems. So the, and concerning the churches in Europe, the Orthodox Church of Greece, uh, the Orthodox Church of Romania, the Church, Orthodox Church of uh, Bulgaria, and so on, they, have, they don't have an, an alternative uh, which the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church have this famous social doctrine of the Church that consider that the priority is to help those who are in need and so on. The Orthodox Church is still in this political theology of eschatology, the liturgical, uh, the, the participation to the gospel is liturgical, is the participation in the eschaton. In, you see, it's not today in, in my streets with my neighbor. This 
Of course, it exists. There are some examples. But you won't, would not find the, the equivalent of the caritas, for instance, in the Orthodox Church. It doesn't exist. Why? Again, because the most important problem is connected with this illness, uh, with this wrong political theology, with these old heresies that were not healed. And this is why what I have done in Ukraine at the Institute of Ecumenical Studies with the different Orthodox churches is to try to promote dialogues and also a kind of therapeutic dialogue in order to, to, to help and to say, you don't, do not need to, to be frightened. There is, you need to be optimistic. There, there are solutions, you see? And uh, this is why there is an example, a positive example of dialogues between the Orthodox churches from, well, we could not say now from the Moscow Patriarchate because they decided in May 2022 to cancel any official connection, connection with the Moscow Patriarchate. Even if the uh, Ukrainian state is telling to them, you are still depending from the Moscow Patriarchate because you have the same liturgy, the same language, the same theology, the same heresy. They say, but we don't want to have anything uh, in contact now with the Moscow Patriarchate. In any case, this is why we want to be Ukrainians. We want to work in solidarity with our nation. We are against the war. And we will work together on the level of military chaplaincy. And this is, for me, a beautiful example that when the Orthodox Church uh, tried to, uh, to put the faith first before the institutional approach, then it gives a, a, a vibrant church and a church that is helping the nation to resist against uh, the war that the Russians started against them. I believe that war changes a lot. Yes, we have military chaplains, Orthodox chaplains. Sergei Dimitrov is here in this room. He is the main chaplain of the territorial defense of Ukraine. He also founded something, something like Caritas, Eleos, from Greek. This organization is supposed to, it aims to do something that Caritas does. Massimiliano, a question to you. Sanda Gigio, can it play a role here? For a role for those who, has, who have decades of experience in organizing communities, experience in dialogue, in how to enter into dialogue. Thank you very much. Let me again begin with a quote from Athenagoras, the great patriarch. He wrote a book in which he speaks of sister churches, brotherly nations. Here, enemy, enemy, the governments that are enemies, but not necessarily the churches. So after this aggression, the language has become even harsher. Here, I would like to focus on this polarity that does exist in the Catholic Church. Synod begins tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, the speaker correct himself. A vigil, Teze community vigil will take place. This prayer needs to be supported. So, in the same country, people live in the same homes, but separately. The Pope is not listened to, bishops are criticized, people pick and choose which preacher they would like to follow on YouTube. Actually, it's a thing that we are familiar with, are we not? But there is another aspect of this thing, something that was laid bare by this wall, namely the face of Europe of solidarity, the kind of Europe that is active, even in those countries 
whose government uh, had for years refused to accept migrants. In a few months, the doors were opened, opened to millions of Ukrainian refugees. So Christians and churches played a huge role there. It showed that this humanitarian crisis might not be used to threaten voters. If we talk about migration peacefully and calmly, people will be willing to take people in, to take refugees in, and to help others. It's a new fact. It's a new fact that needs to be deliberated on. As Professor Azhakovsky said, there are institutions, but also there are churches. There are communities, Christian communities too. Ambassador Tombinsky is a friend and he spent a lot of time in Rome there. He had this opportunity to get this insider's look to see how our community works for peace. It's not about diplomacy, no, that's not what I mean. It's not about pacifism, no, it's about something else. It's about working for peace, that's the goal. In other words, it's about, it's about taking responsibility whenever problems arise. It's about trying to respond, right? R respond like in responsibility, right? Responsibility is about responding, the same call. So the question is, what can we do as Christians? What can we do to create this space for mutual respect? The situation in Ukraine is very complex indeed. And those people need to be supported. Cardina Cardinal Zuppi is the person that they have in mind as a, the president of the um, Italian Episcopate. He was named by Pope Francis as the envoy. He is the envoy for humanitarian affairs and he was sent to Ukraine and Car the Cardinal needs our support. He needs to be supported. Mr. Nadim, may I ask you to say a few words? Please talk about the Muslim community. How does the Muslim community respond to the needs of refugees? After all, we also have here Muslim refugees here in Europe. They, they are also present in Ukraine. At times we forget about that. We forget that Islam is, does not consist only of migrants from Middle East. We also have Islam here in Europe. Islam has existed here for ages. And the Crimean Tatars community is a very good example there. You have been there since the 14th century. Have you, you have co-created Europe, have you not? We've got up to 3,000 Muslims of Tatar origin here in this country. These are Polish Tatars. Historically speaking, they lived in Rushiki and Rushiniany. There are two beautiful wooden mosques in Gdas, that is a modern mosque. So these are the communities that have been living here for 600 years now. Poland has its own Muslims, so to speak. These Muslims, these Tatars, accepted around a hundred Crimean Tatar families that were fleeing in 2014 after the annexation. I've mentioned that these religious communities were persecuted because they refused to be controlled by the Russians. So these people seeked refuge here in Poland. From the point of view of the international, there was no legal basis to grant this refugee status, to do it en masse. At the time, Ukraine was not defined as a country at war the way it's been defined since 2022. People simply argued that there's no war, so there's no grounds for granting the refugee status. This is what they said at the time. Still, 
the doors were opened and the Polish Tatars started taking in those refugees, those families. Not only material help was provided, mostly it was about helping them to stay here longer, so they took them into their own religious communities. Often they took them into their homes or they helped them to find jobs and to settle here. When you go there to the east you can see these Crimean Tatars. By uh, by now they have largely integrated with the Polish Tatars living there. After the 24th of February 2022, there have been waves of new Crimean Tatars arriving here in Poland. Well, it's difficult today to assess the numbers because uh, they are all treated as uh, citizens of Ukraine also by the border guards, so they are part of the roughly one million of Ukrainian refugees that have received the status uh, of a refugee and uh, protection in this country. We know that that's roughly, well, hundreds of, uh, of um, Tatars from the Crimea. They are representatives of uh, religious communities. Some of them are conservative uh, Tatars, but also many young uh, people. Thanks to the reaction of the Polish state and Polish society, they've uh, uh, received many different opportunities, also educational opportunities here in Poland. We've got up to 20 students. There used to be 25, but some of them returned, but still a number of Tata students in Gdańsk, Gdańsk University and other locations. Special quotas were prepared for those students. Some of them returned to Kyiv. At least uh, one, from what I know, is either fighting uh, actively or was fighting uh, the Russians uh, there in the troops, Ukrainian troops on the front. They integrate very well in uh, Poland. They uh, speak Ukrainian. Uh, now, after nine years of Russian occupation, it's more difficult with U Ukrainian, but they have good knowledge, at least passive knowledge of Ukrainian, so they manage quite well in Poland, learning Polish. Some of them lived in uh, closed communities in, in the Crimea. Some of them were... Uh, believers uh, somewhat uh, uh, with many reservations to other religions, but now it seems that they are more and more open and uh, doing really well here in Poland. So I could give you many examples of solidarity and support, solidarity of Polish Tatars, also Polish Muslims, because if we think about uh, the uh, community as, uh, and the reactions, uh, of the Muslim world. Maybe later we will speak more on this, but here maybe the picture is not so rosy. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us this example, example of Polish Tatars who welcome Crimean Tatars. Not much is said about this subject in Poland in the media. Before I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, for questions from the room, you can already start thinking about your questions. Can I still ask our panelists about the future, what it lies ahead, what can be the role of churches, religious communities in overcoming those divisions in perhaps actions that will be taken after the war, how to help also people who suffered during the war. Just to give you an example of uh, the Ukrainian refugees, should the different churches help those refugees integrate in the new communities, in the new countries, or should it focus on maintaining their identity with the perspective that sooner or later they will return to their country to encourage them perhaps to go back to, to Ukraine? What should be the role, therefore, in your view of the different churches, different communities, including also um, San Egito community? how to respond properly in the context of peace also, not only war, but peace, hopefully one day after some sort of the end of the war. I'm not going to try to say 
uh, to define uh, what kind of ending is possible. It would be difficult, actually, of course, to forecast how this war may end. Can we start with Massimiliano, perhaps? Could you be the first one to answer? Thank you. Well, it's like a frost winter in ecumenism, but there is some light, I think, and warmth in the ashes. I think that uh, history is always full of surprises. John Paul uh, II, in a very wise way, spoke about uh, the, the, the peaceful revolution of 1989 in this way. We met in Berlin a few weeks ago. We spoke about that. This was a meeting in the spirit of Assisi. And I would still like to maybe try to distance myself from the events in Ukraine at the moment and to say a few words about the relations between Christianity and Islam. This is, I think, a very important uh, example that uh, might give us also hope in the context of Ukraine. In Berlin, at the meeting, uh, the great Imam of Al Azhar Hamel and Tayyip, he was present there. He is considered the highest authority of Sunni Islam, about a billion people around the world. In his speech in Berlin, he reminded us of uh, the document signed in 2019 in Abu Dhabi. This was a document on uh, human brotherhood together with, I quote, this was signed with dear friend Pope Francis. It's not about kind words between religious leaders only. Actually, al Tayyip uh, and he made it clear, he spoke out against uh, injustice uh, in such countries as Afghanistan, injustice uh, for women, and also attacks in Pakistan, and also burning uh, churches in Pakistan. So he said that it's uh, as uh, serious as burning the Quran in Sweden. But for the leaders of the uh, Muslim word, it's very important, of course. Uh, you realize how important, how serious the burning of Quran, the Quran is. It's, I think, something that needs to be stressed. There is a way that encourages us to look with hope at the relations between uh, religions. The theory of uh, unavoidable clash of civilizations uh, was uh, especially popular after the Twin Towers attack. Of course, this is a huge subject that concerns the life of um, millions of people. There may be reasons to be pessimistic, because in our world, certainly there are reasons for pessimism. But at the same time, let us note that after September the 11th, after many clashes, after divisions, the religions have learned how to work together, how to speak to each other. In Berlin, we were made aware of the fact that the different religions, they learn how to speak to one another. They have respect for one another. This is a very strong historic strength of religions. Can we hope? that the same will happen between the Ukrainians and the Russians. This is the big challenge. Can we hope that this will happen and how to help them actually coexist? I think the question is very much about uh, the extent to which the relations between the churches will be translated into, into human relations. How the churches can influence perhaps uh, the politics uh, countries and whether they can uh, work for, for, for peace. Uh, Father Manuel, if I can ask you to say a few words on that from the perspective of different possible approaches in Europe. Uh, there are different approaches, of course. There are some churches that have also different sensitivities um, because they are set in different historical contexts.
Yeah, that's a, an important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, I think uh, going back also to what was said, what would be the role of churches or the mission of the churches after the war or when the war is finishing? How can they contribute? I think a very important um, uh, question for us is our attitude towards the refugees that have come. So I think here we have an important role as local churches. How we receive these persons, how are they integrated in our communities, uh, what relation will we have? Uh, and this implies a second issue that I think is going to be very important. It's now, and it's going to have its importance from the perspective of the churches. And it's, as we have been seeing this afternoon, ecumenical dialogue. So I think this has to be, again, put in the center. Uh, not only because the people that have come here belong to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, some to our Greek Catholics, uh, and so we have a different landscape or a change in the landscape in the, in the Christian landscape of Europe. But also because I think, as we have seen, the war is connected in some way to the relation between the Orthodox churches. So I think this is going to be a very important thing in the way of prevention, but in the way of also reconciliation. So I think here is going to be a very, very important issue, the issue of ecumenism. And then I think, as you were asking, Ambassador, the, as churches, church has different uh, uh, aspects in its mission. We as comments say we are involved in our dialogue with the European institutions. And as we saw this morning, also the war in Ukraine puts a very big challenge on the European Union. So I think here also, as churches, also as Christians, as we are in this conference, we can contribute uh, to the future of the European Union and to a future of Europe uh, where Ukraine in some way is going to be present. Uh, this morning it was said, uh, the, the place of Ukraine is inside the European Union. This might take time, it's difficult. But I think on this also we as Christians can contribute. So I would say this is more or less a bit um, a panorama of, of the ways as churches we can contribute to a post-war or a finalizing the war and post-war period. Uh, we speak a lot in Commission, we've done some meetings on this, of a new architecture of peace in Europe. So I think there's also an important aspect. Uh, I would say I would, I would work in these lines. So I think the church has an important role to, to play uh, in, in, the, in the period after the war would have, a, would have an important role to play. Tak, to prawda, że historia uczy, że kościoły wojen nie powstrzymują, natomiast odgrywają później ważną rolę w pojednaniu powojennym i w pomocy społeczeństwom w wychodzeniu z tego dramatu, jakim są wojny, a ten dramat dotyka osób w Ukrainie w sposób straszliwy w tej chwili, gdy się czyta i widzi te obrazki, które nam przynosi telewizja, czy czytamy relacje. Jest to strasznie dramatyczne. Ale na ile może... Perhaps strengthen or reborn our Christian thinking so that we think more about others, other people, our neighbors, not about uh, other nations. And moving away from more political thinking to perhaps more focus on individuals and those basic ideas, solidarity, protection of human life, not only pragmatic way of thinking, not only focusing on the economic development or institutions. Wondering to what extent does the current situation influence the way our societies function? Can we see those changes actually also in the thinking of churches, Orthodox churches, but not only also Muslim churches? Uh, Nadim, could you take the floor now? And then Professor Ozhakovsky. Well, I can say that, uh, yes, I share uh, your faith uh, in uh, redefining perhaps uh, some notions and hopefully the word peace will be more often used than war in conferences like this. I've lived for about 20, 22 years in Poland, but my origin is also Ukraine. 
I'm Ukrainian, part of my family still lives in, uh, in Ukraine, different parts of the country, not only in the Crimea. But I need to say that uh, as long as there are rockets, bombs falling on innocent people, it doesn't really make uh, sense, as you know, senseless destruction. Those rockets are not uh, uh, there to hit military infrastructure, but very often they hit civilian uh, buildings, uh, schools, uh, hospitals, theaters. And as long as this continues, it would be difficult actually to expect uh, Ukrainians, but also partly perhaps uh, also, also Poles. Because, well, in Poland there seems to be this uh, thinking, because in Poland uh, it seems that uh, the Polish society knows the Ukrainian society quite well. It's difficult to expect actually us to be involved in the dialogue after the war, because for the Ukrainians today the word peace is uh, linked to the idea of victory. The victory is not about, of course, occupying part of Russia, but getting back Ukrainian land. Land is not the, the only, of course, focus, but the first step is to stop uh, Russian neo-imperialism. Hopefully, in a way, I'm also trying to respond to the question that you have posed. The dialogue, including a religious dialogue, in my view, is possible only at the time when the person who is guilty for, for the war on bringing so much misfortune to, to in, innocent people, they need to simply be held accountable for their crimes uh, judicially, but also within one's conscience. The whole Russian society, of course, uh, is responsible. We should not generalize, of course. Uh, we know that generalizations are not good, and we learn it at, at the time of Soviet Union, certainly. But in my view, responsibility is very much uh, about trying to understand that without a difficult uh, process, very complicated uh, in-depth reflection in Russia about what Russia actually has done, the crimes perpetrated, uh, led by the elites, perhaps political elites of Russia, in the way that was similar, in my view, to what actually happened in Germany, the Nazi Germany, without such an in-depth process, an auto-reflection after, of course, Russian is stopped, but uh, without such a multi-annual, I would say, reflection of this type, it is not possible, in the opinion of many Ukrainians, to speak about uh, dialogue based on mutual confidence that could actually lead to peace and strengthen this peace in the future. So, after various wars, that of World War, World War II and other conflicts, all that shows us that there is no reconciliation without justice. Justice first, and that justice becomes the axis of dialogue that leads to reconciliation. Without justice, reconciliation is going to be shallow, it's not going to be able to survive the test of time. Professor, a few words from you. Tell us about the Orthodox churches how those churches can influence the post-war dialogue. Do they have a role to play? Have they been preparing for that role? Uh, first of all, I, I agree with what has been said right now concerning the importance for the churches to act now. Uh, during the Second World War, there were people like Edith Stein or Bonhoeffer or Mother Maria Skoptsova. They witnessed the presence of God in the history. And that gave the, the ethical basis for a refoundation of Europe based on truth, justice, reconciliation, unity. So churches should act now. But I'm speaking about churches. And this means that we need really to understand, as I said, the difference between institutions and churches. Um, this war is not only a war between the Moscow Patriarchate and the Ecumenical Patriarchate or the other churches. It's not only a, a war between Russia and Ukraine. It's not only a war between Russia and democracy. Uh, it's deeper. It's a crisis of civilization. It's a crisis of modernity. 
And modernity is based on rationality, a positivist rationality, institutional vision of the church. Um, and I have just published a book in French that will be published next week, Pour sortir de la guerre. That is the title, in order to go out from the war. And in this book, I try to give a, a diagnostic of our illness, of our modernity. And I, I, I am explaining that churches, not only the Orthodox churches, but also all the Christian churches are, are responsible to present themselves only as institutions. You know, I have a big admiration for Sant'Egidio, because Sant'Egidio is a, a great community. I was invited at your meetings that are beautiful, that are the, the, the summit I have seen for ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. And I know very well Andrea Riccardi and, and others, but I disagree, I disagree that Cardinal Zuppi meet with Patriarch Kirill, with uh, Mrs. Galina Lvova Belova, who is uh, the woman who is in charge of kidnapping 20,000 children, 20,000 children from Ukraine that were kidnapped and sent in Siberia or everywhere in Russia. And there is a photo, a photo of Cardinal Zuppi uh, giving hands to Mrs. Uh, Lvova Belova. For me, this is the worst uh, possibility for churches to act when th there is this vision of institution that is considering dialogue for peace only as power to big power. That doesn't work. This is at the origin of our war, this inter-institutional approach. We see in the gospel that there is an alternative to this vision. The, 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 the gospel is the start of the church at the Pentecost, when the, 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 the Holy Spirit is blowing and when Jesus Christ is saying, don't be afraid. Uh, when he meets the, the soldier, le, le centurion, and, 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 and the, he says the centurion to the centurion, you have, the, you have the biggest faith I ever seen during my life. Why? Because you believe that love is stronger than physical strength. And because you believe this, then uh, I, I, I will um, heal uh, um, your servitor, you see? So this is why I would like to say, uh, in order to, to conclude, that um, we need today really to change our paradigm. If the churches, and not only the the Orthodox Church, but also the Protestant and the Catholic, want to prepare a new Europe grounded on truth, justice, peace, then they really need to go out from modernity or post-modernity and rediscover that church is a special community that is an eschatological community that is based on love. On, on, on the most important that is able to uh, prepare peace. This is, uh, uh, this is not theoretical um, position. We consider that it's the same for diplomacy. Our diplomacy in France was a realistic diplomacy that in fact was a hypocrite, hypocrite diplomacy. The real diplomacy is based on principles. And if churches and institutions and states, like Steinmeier said recently to the Sante Gitio meeting, are based on principles and then on love, then peace will be back. Thank you so very much for this, son. Yeah. Thank you very um, yes, uh, just to react him because I like this distinction between institution 
and the faithful and the church. Uh, but um, we have to maybe discuss this, uh, both of us. But I think uh, the church has also an institutional dimension. And uh, it's only a part of, of ourselves. It's part, it's part, but I think it's an important part. And, and I would say also the church as institution is called to contribute. Uh, and I would um, put the mission of Cardinal Zuppi in this context. Uh, I think it is possible to discuss who he meets. Uh, yes, no, I think that's possible. But I think his idea of being sent by the Pope to try to have, to try to open a dialogue is legitimate. With someone that is the International Criminal Court is considering that she is in, in responsible for a genocide. You see, this is a, the, the, the it's it's a real crime. It's horrible for the reputation of the of the Catholic Church in Ukraine. The Pope was very popular when I was living there. 15 years ago, when the Pope John Paul II came, uh, millions of people came. Now, when you speak with Ukrainians about the popularity of the Catholic Church, that when the Pope is also saying that you should, to the Russians, you should be proud of your imperialist past, then, you know, Ukrainians are considering that this is not our Pope, because imperialism is... The, the, the start, the, the reason of our, the, 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 the most horrible war in the history of Europe since 1945. So this is why I really think, of course, uh, there is an important dimension on the institution, on the constitution, but again the Pentecost is going further than institution and constitution. It's a Trinitarian dimension and we Today, it's urgent for the churches to, to understand that, because if they don't, then they will be, they will be, I don't know what will happen. Massimiliano, you the microphone. Hello, you took the mic. But I would like to ask our panelists, I would like to ask our panelists to consider the following. Imagine that you need to formulate one or two postulates. Imagine they need to formulate two postulates for your churches, your respective churches. What should those churches say to the politicians in Europe? Which rules should they do to follow today? What should be done to get out of this crisis? This is a task for you. Consider it for a moment. Just think about these one or two postulates that should be followed. Mansimiliano, now and then we shall have questions from the room, from the floor. It seems to be working. I need to say something here. Indeed, there are churches, but there are also institutions. So I find something difficult to understand here. So institutions do exist, right? And you have these institutions. And you have Zelensky, who is the president of Ukraine. Zelensky is asking for one thing. He's approaching the Pope and he is asking him one thing. Help me, please. In the context of those children that have been kidnapped, help me there. So the question is, who do we need to talk to to free those children? Who do we need to talk to to liberate them? And here a quote. It's a person that I met in Rome last week, literally last week. The meeting had been organized by the embassy of Ukraine in Rome. Dmitro Lubinets is the person. He is the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Ukrainian Parliament. So, have we heard, he's a, he plays a leading role in President Zelensky's entourage. This person said, I believe that the Church could act as a mediator, an in as a go-between in this situation. Now, Russia is waging a war of aggression on us, and it, during this war, the Holy See can play a role of a mediator. This is what he said. 
then he had been asked about Zuppelli's mission. What do you think about it? By the way, he met with the cardinal in Kiev. So the Ukrainian response, the peaceful mission of the Holy See is very important for us. We do appreciate the work of the special envoy of Pope Francis. We appreciate it in Ukraine. How can you, where can you read it? Actually, Vatican News, this website, you can read those words in Polish there too. So we have these ideas of talking, of having a dialogue. Yes, it would be great to talk to certain people. It's true. But if I talk only to people I want to talk to, well, it means that I cannot do my job. I'd rather not meet Vova Belova or Kirill, the Pachak. I'd rather not meet them. I'd rather went to have a pizza with Father Adam Bonietsky. This is my preference. This is what I would love to do. Unfortunately, the Pope had sent me to have a conversation with Vova Belova and with Kirill because President Zelensky had asked us to do something to liberate their children. The Holy See is not the, well, it is not, it is not neutral. The Holy See does not take sight, but it is not the same as being neutral. Now the Pope had met with the Synod of the Greek Catholic Church. Some of the bishops said, He gave us a dossier of 266 interventions for Ukraine. So on average, one intervention per two days. This is the dossier that he had presented to us. Now, the Pope, since the beginning till the end of the martial law in Poland, had not talked about Poland the way Francis is discussing on covering the situation in Ukraine. There is one issue here, similar to Professor Azhakovsky, I see the thing, namely one photo speaks more than a thousand words, and you have this image that goes out to the world, a photo from the meeting with Vova Bielova or others, and that photo gives the opposite impression to what we've just heard. Professor Azhakovsky, I believe, would like to present a repartee to what you have said, Massimiliano. Yes, thank you. Of course, I understand that it's not an easy thing. Um, but because I, I have also some experience in ecumenism, I, I believe that dialogue is not possible at any uh, at any case, yeah. Um, and it's not because he spoke a lot about Ukraine that it's what Ukrainians would like to hear from the Pope. In a, again, institutions are in, uh, on the quantitative side, whereas the Church is on the qualitative side. Zelensky, he asked one thing to the Pope when he came, uh, last June, he said, could you condemn the crime of genocide in Bucha? Just one question. And uh, we didn't hear the condemnation of this aggression in Bucha by the Pope. Uh, we said, uh, there, are, there were lots of words, but Zelensky, when he came back to Ukraine, he put a tweet and he said, can you, can you say that? And there was no answer. So what I'm saying is that for real dialogue in truth, yes, we need mediators. And it's wonderful that the, the Roman Catholic Church tries to do it. But first of all, it would be good if you could ask to the Greek Catholic Church of Ukraine what they think about that. And second, would be good if you could find in Russia other mediators. Not Kirill, not Putin, not Lvova Belova. They are not mediators, they are aggressors. 
Among mediators, there are lots of Russians in the democratic opposition. Yesterday, I was in Caen. I was meeting with uh, Evgenia Karamurza. She is a Christian Orthodox. And her husband, Vladimir Karamurza, is a Christian Orthodox. He is in jail for 25 years in Russia because he said it's a war I am against this war. So the, the prophetic thing that would be wonderful the Roman Catholic Church could do would be to meet with these prophets, with these mediators, and condemn the crimes in, 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 uh, in, in, in Ukraine, say the truth, and it will have a powerful uh, message, for instance, in Brazil, in South America. Brazil will stop to say, we are neutral, we, we, are not in, we, we don't know who is uh, in, at the start of this war. Brazil, if they will hear from the Pope a word of condemnation of Bucha as a genocide, then Brazil will support Ukraine, and then we'll, we will help uh, this pressure with dissidents from Russia on, on the Russian state, on the Russian church, and maybe Putin will in this case say, let's stop. First of all, I would like to travel, and now I can't travel anymore because of the condemnation of international tribunal courts. And second, I don't want to lose this war. Uh, I don't want to have Brazil, India, and China against me. So I will, uh, I will give back the children. That will be the good answer from Sant'Egidio and from all mediators that I appreciate very much. Just a, a small reaction. <laughs> Only a small reaction because I think um, maybe that's why in the beginning when you said if the church has reacted well, I didn't want to enter much into that discussion. <laughs> I mean, that's a very big discussion. I would say um, I understand a photograph uh, might do a lot of harm and hurt a lot of people. Huh? I understand also that some words of the Pope that might be said in a context, he also justified or explained in which context that those words about the Russian imperialism were, were expressed. My, those words might also not be correct, and he admitted this. Huh? But I think we have to distinguish inside the institution huh? that I know that the church is not the institution, or it's not only the institution, but inside the institution, there are different um, missions. Uh, so one thing is preaching, one thing is having a prophetic voice, one thing is ha giving witness even to the blood, as many Christians have done, and one thing is also having diplomatic relations and complicated dialogues. This has been also always in the history of diplomacy. Yeah, so... Yeah, well, yeah, but... The diplomacy works. Nuncius Apostolski is cały czas w Moskwie. The diplomatic channels are open. Yeah, that's what I say. The diplomatic, diploma, diplomatic relations have their, their, their peculiarity. No? That has to be respected, I think. Patrzę na salę. Czy jakieś pytania? Tam widzę... Are there any questions uh, from the room? One question from the back of the room, another question from row three. Good afternoon, Andrzej Grajewski from Gośnie Dzielny Weekly. Listening to the discussion here, I thought that uh, you still have not uh, discussed uh, one important issue, maybe one of the most important issues where Russia occupies uh, the area basically all, uh, all priests of all different churches had to leave the area apart from those representing Moscow Patriarchate. If we speak about religious uh, problems, these are not theological discussions between different uh, churches, Orthodox churches, but what we see is brutal Russian force. The Moscow Patriarchate is, of course, uh, benefiting from that the two largest Catholic structures in eastern Ukraine, and I know the subject very well because since 2014 I'm traveling there on a regular basis. Last week I was in the Zaporozhye region. And of those structures, the Kharkiv Zaporozhye diocese, Catholic diocese, and another, the eparchy, Donetsk eparchy, Greek Catholic, uh, literally all, all priests were forced to leave the area 
also those representing the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, all pastors of the different Protestant communities also were forced to leave. All Muslim communities were forced to leave. Where the Russian Mir is introduced, there is no room for anybody else apart from those representing the Moscow Patriarchate. I think that uh, this is something that has to be said very clearly so that uh, all the different churches that you represent uh, also speak out uh, asking for one small thing, you might say, so that those priests representing different churches can go back to their communities, communities in the area occupied by Russia. This is not going to change the political situation, but it should make it possible for those who remain there in occupied areas so that they have also support from their churches. This, I think, is a clearly, clearly religious mission. And as for ecumenism that uh, so much has been discussed here, I think that in this context, uh, let us uh, also remember about this type of ecumenism that was uh, uh, linked to the event when Pavlo Hanchuruk, uh, the bishop of a uh, local church, we had a bishop of the Ukrainian uh, church actually staying in, in one basement at the time of the siege of Kharkiv when they were living together, praying together, two different bishops representing two different uh, churches. Is there a better example of ecumenism? What do we speak about theological differences? Well, we've got brutal force in play, destroying everything. Rockets that are aimed at and hitting Orthodox churches. In Komishovahe, for instance, two hours before the lit liturgy, there were people already trying to get there before the before Easter. It was not a mistake. There is no military uh, aim there. They wanted to hit the church. They wanted to show who rules there and how much they care about the church and the faithful. If we stay at the level of very general debates as here, we are not going to move forward and we will never call by name what actually happens in Ukraine. This is my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrzej, for your comment. And now another voice from the third row here. Thank you, Andrzej Gerlach. With great interest, I have been following your discussion. I'd like to draw attention to yet another issue the comments made by the Pope about the war in Ukraine. Well, I, let me also add, I consider Pope uh, someone very special and I've got great sympathy for him. But they were unfortunate, certainly. They were those comments uh, about uh, the attack on all the countries that in a military way support Ukraine were heard clearly around the world. And the comments for the Russian youth mentioning the uh, uh, fantastic heritage of the Russian imperialism that Russia can be proud of. These were the comments that were heard around the world. Well, I do realize that uh, Pope Francis perhaps as uh, he comes from um, Latin America. His uh, perhaps uh, sensitivity may be somewhat different from our European sensitivity. Yes, I realize that. But one more issue, if I may. Yes, much has been said about uh, uh, diplomacy of the Vatican. But certainly the Pope is using different services, also diplomatic services, that support him. Let me draw attention to someone who has not been mentioned. Cardinal Pietro Parol, the Secretary of State. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vatican services were informed about uh, relations, uh, somewhat dubious relations of the uh, then Nuncio Pietro Parolin in Venezuela, relations to the Russian diplomatic services. So I think that, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think you are moving away from the very subject. No, Ambassador, we are not moving away from the focus of the discussion. But he's the one who, in 2013, as you know very well, he actually 
as uh, is heading secretary of uh, the diplomacy, the Vatican diplomacy. He is the ha top diplomat of the Vatican. But it's not about condemnation of the Catholic Church. But, but Ambassador Cardinal Pietro Parolin, over the last 10 years, he, in a very conscious way, actually cleansed the diplomatic services uh, in the Vatican, removing in this or that way. Uh, many specialists and replacing them with somewhat uh, n dubious nominations, priests who in some way, this or that way, have links to Russia. So I think that uh, we should ask the question, following question, isn't it somewhat worrying at least uh, how far actually the influences of Russia can be felt in the current office of the Secretary of State of the Vatican. I think we have to speak about that, even if it's not comfortable for us. Because for me, member of the community of the Catholic Church, I find it painful. It's painful for me to, when I listen to the comments of my Pope about uh, Russia, but also I'm worried by the influences of uh, the Russian aggressor in the Vatican itself. Yes, I could also say a lot about that because I uh, spent four, four years working there, but this is not the main subject of the conference. Next question, yes, over there, yes, please. Andrzej Sadowski, Centrum. Andrzej Sadowski, Adam Smith, Center, a think tank. I've been listening to this discussion on the position taken by the Holy See and the Pope himself. It seems like we are returning to the medieval discussions on whether devil himself can be saved or not. This is what it feels like. Today, we are talking about the consequences. The consequences of the fact that in recent decades, the West has been pretending that Russia is a free, loving, normal country that appreciates free market economy rather than a reawakening empire willing to be aggressive. And it was revealed two decades ago in the military doctrine. Now, if you had a glimpse at that new doctrine, you would have no doubt that this reawakened empire would sooner or later strike back. Alain Besançon has one coined this expression, the empire of evil, and this notion has survived. The empire has not changed its stance vis-à-vis -vis its neighbors and the rest of the world. It has not, and for that reason it's no surprise that it is invading other countries the way we have witnessed. So an observation now. This fact that I've said is not discussed. Basically, it is all the consequence, natural consequence of the fact that the empire has been reawakening and re being rebuilt for the last two decades. The church could have seen this process earlier. After all, there are Christians in Russia, and the Christians in Russia have been informing about that, and they were better informed, were they not? Also, the role of various Polish circles have been underplayed, and the Polish circles have been warning, warning that Russia is not changing in some respect. And actually, we see that because the Pope praised the Russian imperialism. So a question to the gentleman, would you be so willing to... So basically, in other words, can the devil himself be saved? That's the question to you. Can the devil be saved? That's the question. That's the question to the panelists. Can the devil be saved? And Lan Olbricht. A question from the MEP. Yes, this discussion points to us that we Catholics need an open, regular discussion. And we have not had such discussions, and now here they are. These discussions with Comerci in Brussels are not any easier than what you're witnessing right now. And the father knows it 
all too well. These are the same questions put to Comissi in Brussels. The questions are not easy, the, the, the conversations are not easy, and you see that the father represents Comissi, very diplomatic answers are his answers here, you can see that. We MEPs were in Vatican, it was a few days after the aggression. Now, what I heard there was much harsher than what you're saying here. No, I'm just trying to show that we need an open conversation. We Catholics we need to have this conversation because nobody wants to talk about that, especially our church. And this conversation is needed. A question, because Janek asked us to ask a question. Professor Zhakovsky, a question to you. We have met a number of times, and you, Professor, have explained those things to us a number of times. So the first question, the Orthodox Church, the Moscow Orthodox Church, and aside here, also in Poland, because we have this Polish Orthodox Church, which is which has links to the Moscow Patriarchate. So the, this Moscow Church, do you believe this church has part has participated in the in this aggression, this religious element? Is it that religion was turned into an instrument, or was the religion itself a player? Remember, it happened after the Auto-Catholic Church got separated. There was this famous decision that a referendum was held in all parishes, and also assets were taken away from the Moscow Patriarchate, right? So is it that they were at all, or is it that they participated? Let me explain why it's important. When we are in the parliament, on the one hand, you've got those who refer to Christian values. On the other hand, these, this, all the, the whole left, they want to have nothing to do with that. And Christians are killing one another. Christians are fighting Christians. That is what's happening. Those who are non-Christians are looking at it, and they are simply using it. So, Professor, what do you think? What is your prediction? What do you think is going to happen to the Orthodox Church after this war? What's going to happen after the war is over? Because we've got this Patriarchate of Constantinople, and he used this word schism. Heresy is another concept that was mentioned. So, the question, what do you predict? Is it that some people will be true Orthodox Christians and others will not be non-true Orthodox Christians? What's going to happen to the Orthodox Church assuming the war one day is over? That's a proper question for you. Thank you. This, this is, is a beautiful, beautiful uh, question. question. It's, it's not an easy, easy question. question. And I myself are asking to my friends who are specialists, what do they think what will happen? Um, we need, first of all, to understand the history of the Moscow Patriarchate. The, the, the Moscow Patriarchate was relaunched by Stalin in September 1943 during the Second World War, and it was not just a gift. It was a deal. And the deal was you will be inside our hands and we will give you the possibility to uh, reopen some churches, to do baptism and so on. But you will be in our hand, which means we will name the bishops, the metropolites, and we will uh, uh, ask them to, to be part also of the KGB, the FSB, and so on. It's a reality. And it was uh, documented. Uh, Father Gleb Yakunin, uh, he went in the archives at the beginning of the 90s and he saw everything. And now we know exactly what happened with the actual Patriarch Kirill, how he worked for the KGB in the 70s when he was in Geneva. We know everything. So we, we need to understand that in order to, to, to understand that tomorrow this church has no future. Uh, what are the alternatives? The alternatives are on one side. The alternative of what happened in the 20s. In the 20s, there was a, a split inside the Russian church. 
1932, in Paris, the Russian churches in the immigration decided to, to stop any contact with the uh, Moscow uh, Patriarchate, and they asked to be part of the ecumenical patriarchate. Um, this is why the Moscow Patriarchate is so frightened by the influence of the ecumenical patriarchate, because the best forces of the Russian immigration, which means people like Berdyaev, Bulgakov, or Fedotov. Fedotov was the first Russian historian to condemn imperialistic Russian culture and to see and to say that we should Russians ask for forgiveness to the Ukrainians because Ukrainians have uh, year after year uh, built their own Ukrainian identity and statehood. So, uh, the alternative is this church that uh, renewed the ecclesiological basis, uh, the historiographical basis. They proposed a new story. And the new story is not to say that there is a direct link between uh, uh, Jesus Christ, Kiev in the 10th century, and Patriarch Kirill today. They said there is another story which is much more complex explaining that in Ukraine, in the 14th century, uh, the, the Knyas Danilo, the Prince Danilo, he was made Rex Russiae by the Pope at that time, and he continued the statehood of the Ukrainians in western part of Ukraine, and they became, and they were orthodox, and they were legitimate to, to defend their uh, heritage from Byzantium and from the Kievan statehood. So this other story, this other historiography, uh, it was proposed in this uh, Russian church under the Ecumenical Patriarchate. And for myself, this is the only future for, for the Russian church. This is what already Father Alexander Meign, who was a very famous priest uh, at the beginning of the 1990s in Russia, he he was the most popular Orthodox priest in Russia and I would say in the world. Lots of people asked for baptism because they, they heard Father Alexander Main or they read their book. He was saying exactly the same. You need to read Berdyaev, you need to Bulgakov, you need to read um, uh, Fedotov. And then we will renew our identity. Uh, we will heal our heresies. So there is, there is a way, but uh, this way is not the, the KGB church. And it means a big reform to, to see that. And we need to prepare this in the West, including by a dialogue with autocephalist church. Uh, the Polish church is autocephalist on the principle. She, she, it, it's, uh, it's not uh, an autonomous church, part of the Moscow Patriarchate, it has, it has its own identity. So I think it's a good place for, for, for dialogue. Thank you so very much. Let me return to my question. Which principles, which suggestions would you present to your own communities or to your own churches? In other words, what should be done differently? What should be done better? What can be done in the future? Very briefly, you need to be convincing. Let me respond to what the gentleman has said. Well, basically, I have no answer. I cannot tell you whether you can save the devil, because this is how I understood your question, whether you devil can be saved. There's another question, though. Can you talk to the devil can you talk to the devil on behalf of the people who are suffering because of the war? I believe so. You can talk to the devil. Now, I have brothers and sisters in Kiev that belong to our community. The seat on the 25th of March 2022 was bombed. Their seat was bombed by Russian missiles. So, speaking on their behalf, let me say the following. 
because of that, you can even take a photo with this lady, with this devil. Remember, John Paul II was also criticized because of certain meetings, I believe it was 1986. Now, in 1983, John Paul II met with Jaruzelski in Belvedere. And he was criticized by the Polish opposition circles. Who was right? So, Massimiliano, your principle is to talk even to the devil, provided the impact can be positive. Talk to the devil and be convincing in this conversation. Father Manuel. I think the questions were very interesting, huh? But um, can I try to answer in 30 seconds to these three questions? Because the first question was about uh, in, the, in these regions in Ukraine that have been invaded to go bring back the priests that were there and were, and were sent away. Huh? So I think this will be a very important um, commitment for the churches to try to work in this direction. I think they are, maybe it's another contribution that as churches and churches working together, we can, we can do uh, or we can think about how to do. Uh? I think uh, uh, that's a very good issue you brought, out, you brought up. Secondly, was there a, a naivete, was there a sort of ingenuity in the way we thought about uh, Russia? Did it, weren't the churches um, capable of foreseeing what was going to happen? Uh, I think in this, it's also uh, an interesting question. I think a bit all of us were naive, not in some way. Uh, and this leads me to another thing that I want to say, even if maybe you don't agree with it, all of you. I think, uh, in some way, the relations with Russia have to be thought if they, if they were being done in a, in, a, in a good way before the war started. Uh, so I think this is a, an important question that we have to ask ourselves. And the third question was about um, the influence of Russia uh, inside the Secretary of State of the Vatican. I don't know this, huh? I don't know this. But I think if we don't have really data that go in this direction, it's a very... It's a very, I would say, not, not, not appropriate statement to make. Huh? So if we say that, we have to have uh, really some, 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 uh, some material facts that prove that. Huh? My idea, I would, I would be very, very, very surprised that this is so. Huh? I would be very surprised that this is so. And then... On your, on your point, what would I say? Uh, I would say dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Huh? That's something important. Maybe even with the devil. Huh? Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And I would say also the question of principles. It's very important. Huh? Professor. For, um, for me, dialogue is not going in the right direction if it's not in the truth. On the contrary, it's very dangerous. And I would not speak with the, with the devil. I would not speak with the devil. Judah spoke with the devil and he died. You know? Um, so, I, I think um, what would be necessary today, what, what is possible is to heal our illness of modernity. Uh, the illness of the Orthodox Church is its... Uh, imperialism and it's possible to 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 heal this the french people were a, a colonialist uh, uh, empire and we are still in in this colonialist vision we know what's happening in africa today we see how it's deep how it's difficult and how it's necessary to come back to a diplomacy based on principles 
that is doing what it says. So it, it's possible. Uh, what would be useful, I think, because the Pope himself, I, I note the words, the Pope, what should be done. He's, the, the Pope, when he came back from Mongolia, they asked to him, the journalists asked to him, but why did you say that the Russians should be proud of Peter the Great? Putin is saying the same thing, so you are speaking like Putin. And, and the Pope said, perhaps it's not right, I don't know. Historians should tell us, but it is an addition that came to mind because I had studied at school. So historians should tell us, and I think that's what should be done. We need to organize a, a meeting with historians. Riccardi is a historian. Uh, Spadaro at the Civiltà Cattolica is also a good historian, and then put uh, some historians from the, uh, um, the, 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 the good Russian tradition, the good Western tradition, that would uh, explain uh, uh, the, 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 the right history in order to, to give the keys to, to, to the Pope. I, we can understand, I, I, I agree with you, he comes from uh, uh, another civilization, he, he has no all the details <laughs> about Peter the Great, maybe for the Jesuit community, uh, Peter, uh, Catherine II had a, a good influence, I don't know, but not for Ukraine. So we need to explain what concretely happens. So education is the good tool in order to heal um, our uh, uh, failure today. So we had dialogue. So we had uh, dialogue, principles, education, and Nadim, what else can you add to that? Well, can the devil be saved? Well, i pis to jest jedno z jego imion i w islamie stosowane właśnie jest to określenie. Jakby uzasadnie, prawda? I think that this uh, uh, whole notion of the devil in Islam is such that you don't speak to the devil. No, definitely not. As uh, Islam religion uh, is decentralized, there is no institution that can be comparable to this of the Pope. Sometimes I think maybe it's a good solution. But I think that it's difficult to personalize some of those expectations towards the Muslim world, saying that we expect this or that. That might be easy in the case of uh, Christianity. And of course, as for the world of Islam, of course, there are many objections you can have. Mustafa Jamile, the head of uh, Tartars of the Crimea, at the World Congress, he said that well, he he regrets that there is lack of reaction of the Muslim world to the suffering of Crimea and Tatars. 2022, after the aggression of uh, Russia again, he repeated that, and there was no reaction. There was no mass global reaction of the Muslim world, and no clear act of solidarity. Yes, decentralized uh, Islam is very much uh, part of the national context in different countries. And in my view, in the contemporary world, most of the Muslim countries, they are not, these are not free countries, these are not democratic countries in the way we understand it. So yes, it's difficult to uh, appeal for, for such uh, values. It's difficult also for the uh, Muslim communities to understand why Crimean Tatars today speak out for such values as liberal democracy, the rule of law, human rights. In many societies of the Muslim world, they are associated with uh, the Western world, Western colonialism and ill-treatment of their countries by the Western world. So this, these are some of the doubts they have and uh, the dialogue that I think is missing in many uh, countries among the, at least the intellectuals, it, it is missing and it is a problem. And uh, the Tatars, the Muslim Tatars, I think, have more faith in 
and the Christian uh, churches, Orthodox and Catholic churches, both of them, because it is, I think, their impression that those churches understand better the fate of uh, Crimean Tatars, the Ukrainians, or the fate of the Ukrainians, where they want to fight, they want uh, their values uh, respected, also secular values, political values, ideas. And then they appeal for solidarity uh, within the Muslim world. It is time to finish for us, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We are finishing the second panel. Consequences of the war for the churches was the title of this panel discussion. Additional questions uh, uh, certainly could be asked. Uh, perhaps next conferences will be organized. We've been able to, able to come up with uh, a number of ideas, principles that should be applied by churches, but one perhaps is of utmost importance, and we have to keep repeating this. The churches need to be close to the faithful, the people, and if the church is uh, not supporting those who have been attacked, those who are poor and weak, it's not good. The church loses its credibility if it supports the aggressors. Thank you very much, and I give the floor to Rafał Budnik. If someone were to be wondering why this uh, chair with a rose has been put here, well, this is the symbolic place of Bishop Pieronek, who usually was sitting here. Uh, usually he was forced to sit in the first row, but he wanted to be discreet, sitting on the side somewhere at the same time. So this is a symbolic place to commemorate his memory. Now, ladies and gentlemen, ahead of us, um, there is a Holy Eucharist, 6 o'clock, at the Church of Apostles Peter and Paul. The address is Grodzka Street 54. At 5.54, 45, 5.45, all priests who would like to co-celebrate this uh, Eucharist, please join us at quarter to six, and then at seven, seven p.m. in the gallery of the Polish 19th century. The entrance is from the side of Adama Mickiewicz.